Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Chela Rajan. I'm uh, going to be moderating this panel. Uh, I'm, I'm with uh, the TELUS Institute, which is a think tank based in Boston. It's been around for about 30 years. Uh, focuses largely on energy and environmental issues. And I've been working in the area of transportation for most of my career. I, first of all, I, I, before our panel gets started, I just wanted to say a few words following up on what uh, Steve Connors said. And I was really excited by th two things. One was the, the uh, graph, the, not the graph, the sort of uh, equation he put up uh, on the screen, which related emissions to a whole bunch of preceding multipliers. So he talked about trips, modes, um, people per car, um, you know, then fuel efficiency and uh, um, sort of the um, uh, emissions factor, as it were, of vehicles. So all of those different factors were important for uh, determining what the final emissions were. And um, indeed, I tell us that's, that's really been our, our approach. We've been sort of trying to break down the different components of sustainable transport, and we've looked at all of these elements. and. And what we've sort of uh, come to realize over the years is that technology plays a very important role, uh, but it only plays part of the role because there are two other important sets of factors. One is uh, land use and the other is behavior. And uh, I also like the fact that uh, 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 Steve pointed out that, you know, he sort of alluded to the fact that land use and behavior are not exactly correlated. In other words, you can, you can live in a, in a village in Newton, but you may not decide to be, uh, you know, engage in sustainable behavior. In fact, there's been some very interesting evidence coming from um, uh, University of California in Davis and uh, from several uh, researchers in the Netherlands who show that, uh, you know, um, the fact that you've, you've moved to um, uh, some kind of a community that's uh, transit friendly doesn't necessarily mean that you'll, you'll start using transit or you'll start walking more. Uh, and and uh, I just want to say very briefly that three things that they say are important. One is habits, attitudes, and context. So the context may be that you have access to, you know, uh, um, bus or walking or bicycling. Um, but if you, if you've, every day if you've sort of been habituated to driving an SUV, uh, you're, and even if your attitudes were to change, you might just, you know, automatically go into your car and, and um, start the engine and say, oops, I should have taken the bus. So, you know, there are all sorts of other psychological behavioral factors that are also important in, um, you know, how these, um, uh, you know, how transport decisions take, take place. I'll just say one final thing, uh, because I think these are, these are issues that are going to come out um, in, the, in the presentations that my panelists are going to make. And that is uh, that the goal of sustainable transportation is really access rather than mobility. In other words, uh, you want to maximize people's access to the services they need. You don't necessarily want to maximize or make mobility more efficient. Mobility is sort of a, one part of the means, but, but access is really what we're, we're looking for. And so that's an important thing to, to bear in mind as well. Uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to just stop speaking about myself and talk a little bit about uh, the uh, presenters. We have uh, all, all the presenters at the table to my right. Uh, and um, I'm going to start with, uh, with Steve Russell. Uh, and I'll introduce the speakers uh, one by one. Steve Russell is the fleet superintendent for uh, the city of Keene in New Hampshire. And uh, he's responsible for the entire city fleet. And the city fleet has been very much in the news. Uh, it's been written about uh, in the New York Times Magazine, Clean Cities News, and so on, uh, primarily because of, uh, of uh, uh, many of the things Steve has done to uh, sort of bring in sustainable practices. So with that, I'll have him. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Thank you, Museum of Science and Alt Wheels. Um, 
Keene, New Hampshire is a small community in southwestern New Hampshire of about 28,000 people. Um, we struggle with our transportation issues just like the big metropolitan cities to the point where the state is trying to make it better for us and even the community. So a few years ago, the city got involved in some clean air things. And as I prepared for this, this talk today, I, the subject was really sustainability. So I kind of looked and said, what does that really mean? So I went online, the usual, and said, okay, what is sustainability? And, and I, I bring to you today two definitions. One appears to me to be a pretty political <laughs> definition, and the EPA d definition from the our bestowed federal government says sustainability is the ability to achieve continuing economic prosperity while protecting the natural systems of the planet, providing a high quality of life for its people. Then I went to the Columbia University site, and I've, I kind of fall into this one. This one's more of a social sustainability definition, and really sustainable development is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. And that really came from the Brundtland Commission of 1987. And really, Columbia University says that global warming is an example of what happens when we do not develop sustainability. So that was a real eye-opener for me to, to really get into the sustainability issue here. And, and when we talk about transportation, um, we need to use the word sustainability at the same time when we talk about transportation. In the city of Keene, um, you know, we started using a, an alternative fuel five years ago. Um, I was able to get um, the city of Keene to get into an alternative fuel very early in the game um, through a lot of homework research. So I wondered why using biodiesel really contributes to sustainability. So I kind of looked at it. So when you really get down to using an alternative fuel, using a biodiesel is a renewable energy source. It reduces the CO2 and the PM 2.5, lessening the impact on the environment. It reduces soot in the engines, burns cleaner, thus enabling the city to keep the equipment longer. And it's healthier for drivers and citizens. And I think the optimal word here is citizens. I think it's wonderful that um, the, the drivers are, are much more healthier, but um, think of that waste management truck. Think of that um, plow truck that goes through the streets and, you know, past in the, in the little diesel that runs down the sidewalks and and someone's shoveling their sidewalk and right in front of them comes this diesel engine. You know, the, the biodiesel really makes a big difference for the, the health of our city, which will sustain our population longer, which is kind of exciting to me. Um, so what else is Keen doing for sustainability? Um, a couple of years ago, I was able to get my hands on a uh, hybrid truck. And the hybrid truck, as we talked about yesterday, you know, hybrid it really has its place. I think it's, it's really designed for inner cities. Um, it's designed to, you know, stop the idling bruja that goes on in, in a lot of our cities. In this truck for us, we use it with the sign department, and um, it, it stops and goes all day long. It never goes out on the highway. He goes from one corner to the next. And, and in addition, not to do a PR for GM, because that's really not why I'm here, it does have it, because of its hybridicity, it has an inverter in it. It has a very large battery so that it's a very efficient for our, for our uh, sign person. He can use, he has electricity to use for his tools. So he doesn't have to um, use big bar and steal tools from neighbors when he's uh, electricity from neighbors. So, um, but that's a, another idea of sustainability. You know, we're, we're cleaning the air just one more way. The other thing that came to mind is as I walked through one of our buildings and saw over 100 bicycles that the police department had, had, had um, con you know, I guess picked up in the streets and they have an auction. I said, why don't we have some bicycles? Because in the city of Keene, we're small enough. We have a rail trail that was, with, was, the rail was taken out. It was paved. It runs through the middle of the city. In the old commercial days, there was a railroad that ran right through town and delivered all the goods to all the industry, which is no longer there anymore. So they had the infinite wisdom to pave it. So people can get back and forth through the city very easily, and it's, it's a bike path, so 
it came to me one day that we should have bicycles so allow the staff to go back and forth between the buildings instead of hopping on a pickup truck, driving a half of a mile, taking up parking spaces. And it's, it's, been a, it's been a good tool for those who want to get on bicycles. And again, it goes back to the attitudes. Some staff will, wouldn't get caught dead riding a bicycle, but they're there for them to use. And I think if it was a Segway, it might make a difference. But we don't have the money for Segways right now. So as the biodiesel was beginning to be used, the city, unbeknownst to myself, was joining the cities for climate protection. They were concerned about the environment, a small city, worried about what was going on. They joined it. They got involved in it. They took an inventory. And they've moved forward into and supported, you know, the sustainability in a small community. So what can you do as a community person? You know, we, we all think, how can we make our community more sustainable? You know, one thing is to ride your bike back and forth, but it's another thing to get involved with a planning board, city council meetings, and insist that the projects be pedestrian and bicycle friendly. I think that's real important as we develop shopping centers, strip malls. You know, let's encourage the bicycles to get there as opposed to just the cars. Um, Suggest that your city join the cities for climate protection. They'll inventory their, all their CO2, their carbon footprint. It'll make a big difference. And demand that your community use biodiesel. You know, go to your fleet manager or your public works department and ask the question, how come you guys don't use biodiesel? The city of Boston is coming to the fold. They're using B5 now, soon to use B20. I think we get more fleets getting involved in this alternative fuel. We will reduce our footprint. Um, and dust off that bike, as Steve said, ride it to work. And if you live too far from work, take it out to go to the post office so or get the newspaper. So that's really how you do it from a small community, which can be done in a very large community. These are some ways to get involved in sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is um, Sonia Hamill. And Sonia Hamill is a uh, special assistant uh, in the Office of uh, Commonwealth Development. Uh, she's uh, served as, uh, for 10 years as a Director of Air Policy and Planning at the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs before this. And um, she's uh, worked with the Central Transportation Planning staff for 12 years and is specialized uh, in the environmental impacts of transportation projects. She holds a master's degree from uh, city in city and regional planning from Rutgers University. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank thanks very much for, uh, for inviting me, and thanks to you all for being here on a Sunday morning. Um, this subject is near and dear to my heart, and I've worked with a number of the people that are on the panel. Um, I, what I want to do is to give you a little bit of the context of what's going on in the Commonwealth around sustainable transportation and to talk about what else needs to happen. There um, is a lot that's going on, but we're far from getting anywhere, being anywhere close to actually reaching sustainability. I think we're making some incremental improvements. And many of the people who are here um, will talk about that for both for Massachusetts and for other New England states. Um, the way that I've looked at a lot of transportation over the years has been through the planning process. Um, and then I had the good fortune to be part of the efforts in Massachusetts to adopt the California CAR program, which originally um, was adopted in 1990 and, and then phased in, uh, which was, was originally designed to reduce our emissions of smog-producing um, chemicals and uh, hydrocarbons and, um, and NOx. And now, more recently, California is also taking steps to reduce the carbon intensity of their emissions. And we in Massachusetts are also um, have adopted that program. Um, that's one of the best things that the state can do. It's about a third reduction over time in the carbon emissions from the vehicle fleet. But it's not what I'm going to focus on today. Um, people who are here are talking about both technologies and systems. And I'm going to focus a little bit on what the state can do and in some cases is doing to improve the overall transportation system. I like what Steve said. He was able to walk to the post, bo post office this morning and he said, or the post box, and he said that was because he was lucky. And the job of my office is to make everybody in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts lucky, um, to make sure that people have that as an option. To um, my uh, 
recent, recently departed boss, Doug Foy, who was head of the Office for Commonwealth Development, used to say that his goal was to make sure that every Massachusetts child could walk to a library, that that kind of community where you have walkability to um, areas of schools and public services is exactly what we want, not that it solves all of our problems, not that it means that we don't have to work for um, higher levels of, of technology, more efficient technology, new fuels, and all these things. And the problem with the transportation sector, in part, is that it's going to take so many pieces. It does take so many pieces, so many kinds of policies, both technology drivers and planning drivers at in large part, on the planning side at the municipal level, most of the tools are not in the hands of the state or the federal government. But it's also why it makes it exciting, because it means that we can make our communities look the way that we want over time. Um, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. It's what I work on most of my time, and it's what I'm most passionate about. Um, and just to fill you in that transportation, if you're if you don't know, it's about a third of the greenhouse gas emissions in New England, uh, in Massachusetts, and, and, and in most of New England, and it's growing. It is the one sector that's growing very fast. Um, the, it's a combination of the kinds of vehicles that we're driving, um, although that has changed a little bit. It looks like it's changing a little bit with the change in price of gasoline, but, but not tremendously. Um, that is, people are, drive, are, are at least more focused when they go to look at new vehicles at more efficient vehicles. Um, that's a big piece of why we've had such high greenhouse gas emission increases in the transportation sector has been the, the increase in SUVs and larger and less efficient vehicles being sold. But also our vehicle miles of travel are increasing about 2 percent a year. As I said, Massachusetts has adopted the, the California car program, which will cause uh, large-scale improvements over time in the CO2 emissions and actually the efficiency as well of the vehicles that are sold here. But I want to focus today on sprawl and on land use development overall and what we can do about reducing the increases in the vehicle miles of travel. Um, it's not the primary subject of this, of this talk, but I think it actually helps to integrate some of the other things that we're doing. Um, a recent study that was done looking at a number of cities in the U.S. shows that we could actually reduce the future emissions of CO2 by between 5 and 25 percent through sets of smart growth and transit improvements, a combination of those. And that's quite significant. That then paired with um, reductions from vehicle technology begin to get us into the realm of the kinds of reductions we're going to need. Um, as I said, these, these decisions are mostly not at the state level. Managing growth has been a top priority in general, um, and in part because cities and towns come to the state and, and, and kind of look at themselves with a whole set of issues of problems, um, particularly high housing cost, um, long commutes and traffic congestion. Uh, There's this whole set of issues that cities and towns in, in New England in general are grappling with. Um, and part of those problems are, it's like a self-reinforcing system. The cost of being able to provide services to areas with very large land area where people are not clustered together, where there's not sort of density, is very high. So some of the financial problems that communities are facing actually comes from the overextension of the physical space um, and the fact that the cost of services begin to outstrip the tax revenues, they bring in new, t new, new services, that, that kind of relationship. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to say that um, some of the technologies and the techniques and the policies that improve sustainability are also really helpful in addressing all of these kinds of issues. That was the specific reason that my office was created. I'm in a really unique office that's been around for about three and a half years. Governor Romney created it when he came into office. And it really addresses the fact that before this, the transportation, environment, housing, and community development and age, energy agencies never talked to each other. Um, I worked in at the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, and I've worked uh, in the transportation agencies, and the relationships are very tenuous. And frequently what would happen is that pl a planning project, a, a highway project, let's say, would start in the highway department, would work its way up. People would spend millions of dollars on it, um, million, uh, many, you know, hundreds of hours of, of, of work on it. And it's probably at the beginning that the environment agencies might have had some concerns, might start talking about what those concerns are, but they had no way of intervening in the system until it got up, you know, five years later, six years later, into the governor's office ready to be built, at which point there were a lot of expectations by communities. There was a lot of money already spent on it. Um, and where the environmental problems were very hard to solve at that point in the design process. The cool thing is that uh, our office was created to integrate policies across all these agencies, and it's actually 
far exceeded my expectations in terms of the kinds of problems that get solved really early on and the kinds of abilities to coordinate policies that have come out of it. And I think it's, it's that kind of connectivity of both looking at the technology side, at the land use planning side, at the energy side, um, at, at the environment side, at the housing community, which we really need. And it's really hard. I mean, human beings are not good at thinking about many things at once, but that's exactly what's needed is this kind of coordination. Um, these are just some of the levers that we can use out of our office. Uh, I think one of the most interesting ones is, is something called Commonwealth Capital, which has put priority spending on projects that are sustainable um, through the, crea the creation of a set of very simple principles. They're, they're not going to be new to you. They're you know, the kinds of things about walkability and you know, pedestrian access and bike, bike access, reusing the facilities and the infrastructure that we already have to the largest extent possible, this idea of fixing first what we have, making it very, very useful, reusing mill buildings, reusing um, buildings that are, that are in downtowns rather than, than destroying them and, you know, going to the suburbs or going to, you know, to green fields. It's both good on the environmental side in terms of the land that's protected, but also good in terms of continuing to use space that is already served by existing infrastructure and potentially can be served by transit. So this Commonwealth Capital Program has basically taken many of the grant programs that the state was already providing and put them through a common filter. That is, we don't give the money out unless it's being used to the maximum public benefit possible. And I have to say that that's had a dramatic effect on the kinds of projects that cities and towns bring to the Commonwealth. Uh, there was a large pipeline of projects beforehand. Some of those projects were good, but many of them weren't. And what's happened is that cities and towns have started to come in with really sustainable projects where they're looking at the energy balance, where they're looking at how they're going to serve the project with transit, with housing built in. They know that we love affordable housing. It's been one of the mantras of the, of the administration. And so they come in having thought about where can I put housing in here? Where can I put people so that they're close to jobs? Now, that doesn't mean that every person that lives in that, in that housing uh, development is going to work right there. But it does increase people's ability, perhaps, to find a match between housing and, and their jobs. Um, so this grant coordination has been very helpful. The other thing that's been very helpful, the, and the, I, mean, I just, I guess I just covered this, which is about $5 billion right now of state capital money is going through these filters for sustainability and for um, integration of housing, community development, transportation, and energy together. Um, and I think the investments are, are really paying off. Um, the areas that uh, are, are prioritized in the scorecard are the zoning, which is really, we call it like the DNA of development, is, is this area zoned properly so that you can have mixed use. And there's been a lot of rezoning for the very first time in, in, in many, many years in the Commonwealth where communities are coming into us. Now, it's their decision. It's not the state telling them that they need to do that. But it's using our funds in a smarter way. So we say, you know what, build something that you really want. Don't build just what the zone, your current zoning allows you to have. Look at what you really want. Um, expanding housing opportunities, uh, making sure there's more affordable housing and more mixed communities, um, and then being able to conserve the natural resources, the, the, the farmland, the forests that you don't need to destroy if you're actually managing to keep more of your development in existing areas. We have a wealth in the Commonwealth especially, but in the rest of New England as well, just an enormous wealth of old, beautiful um, uh, housing stock, mill buildings, um, warehouse buildings that are turning into lovely housing um, and, and also useful for other, uh, for commercial development. Um, so just this idea of lifting the outdated prohibitions on mixed use, responding to customers who want to be able to walk to their mailbox, and allowing a traditional New England village again to be legal. Um, literally in most communities in Massachusetts, you cannot build what we, what we want here. You cannot build a traditional New England village anymore because zoning has so separated out uses. And this is really about letting us have the kind of communities that we, well, I came from New York. I moved to Massachusetts because I wanted to be in the, in the kind of town. A New England town was exactly what I wanted. I did not want to be on Long Island, which is where I'm from. And when I got here, I realized nobody could build one of those anymore. Like, it just wasn't legal. And what we're doing is moving that backwards so that there, the good parts of zoning are maintained, but communities have the option to steer their development. Um, just quickly to say that transit-oriented development is also now a, a big push, and we've got um, many grants going out to try and allow for development, both at parcels that are, I don't know if Eric's going to talk about this at all, but parcels that are around, that are near T stations and that may well be 
that he's going to focus on. But there are more than 25 projects now underway um, where there is development within very close proximity to transit. Um, we have a new highway design manual, which really looks at making sure that any roadways that are built are very community sensitive. And I'd be happy to talk to any, anybody about, about these things more. But there are many smart growth projects that are happening. This is just a few of them in the Commonwealth. Um, they're happening in urban areas. They're happening in suburban areas. Um, here's even more of them, uh, all of them interesting. Many of them started by the communities to handle specific problems that they were having in their own area. But the, the, the impact that it's having is uh, more housing coming in, a, a much better future in terms of our overall energy use and CO2 impacts, because each development really is embedding our future um, emissions path for us. Um, we're embedding in our own communities what, what our energy needs are going to be going forward. And by being able to concentrate this development, we're actually reducing our future costs for energy. Um, by making sure that people can walk, can get there in sensible ways. Um, and these are just, the work's just begun. There's a lot more to do in terms of coordination of the agencies, ongoing embedding of these ideas, uh, and, and making sure that these kinds of sustainable principles um, stay on and that we're all rowing in the same direction um, with targeting capital funds, making sure that smart growth actually does produce sustainability, that we're doing it in that kind of way, and that we really integrate both the technology side and the planning side as well as possible. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sonia. In fact, I just wanted to make a, a footnote. Um, Massachusetts in, is in many ways ahead of California, at least in, in, in this you know, transportation and sustainability, in that it is taking very seriously this the, the, the fact that integrating transportation, land use, and, and behavior are all important components of sustainability. California has got a new proposition on the ballot, um, Proposition 87, this, this November, uh, where they want to reduce uh, oil use by 25 percent. But the, the proposition deliberately disallows the state from actually talking about alternatives to the car. And so it's, it's, it's actually quite interesting that <laughs> that they want to reduce uh, oil consumption primarily through technology. And, and so in that sense, I think it's very interesting that the Office of Commonwealth Development was created to actually try and think about these uh, issues in an integrated, holistic way. Our next speaker is going to be um, Holly. Holly Parker is, is the Commuter Choice Program Manager at Harvard University. And um, she's uh, going to talk um, uh, about her Commuter Solutions Program. Good morning. Thank you for coming here on such a beautiful day to sit in a windowless room and listen to us talk about sustainable transportation. I'm going to talk um, this morning about what Harvard University is doing to promote sustainable transportation. Um, so why, why should Harvard as an employer care about sustainable transportation is the first question I pose to you. Um, I think, first of all, it's important to mention that providing parking facilities is expensive. Um, that's, a, that's a major concern. Um, as we, Harvard University, are expanding into Alston um, to expand our campus, we are looking at $100,000 per parking space to build underground parking over there. Um, the value of real estate is so high in Cambridge and Alston, that this whole area, as you all know, that um, it, to the extent that we can come up with alternatives to building more parking, um, we're going to be more um, competitive. The unwelcome neighbor syndrome I refer to uh, just by way of uh, saying that if you operate as an employer in an already congested area and you bring yet more uh, car trips into the area, and your employees are also parking in residential neighborhoods, even if they're not supposed to, um, you are going to make yourself sort of uh, unwelcome. And I 
worked on site at EMC out in Hopkinton just as they were kind of going through one of their early growth spurts and traffic from 495 was backing up, you know, almost an entire exit worth as employees were trying to get to work out there. So it was very important for them to have someone on site providing alternatives to their employees. There weren't a lot of alternatives out there, I should mention, but we tried to get some carpools started and to expand the uh, Framingham's public transit system to, to serve there. Also, there's a regulatory framework. Um, in the state of Massachusetts, there's a ride-sharing regulation that the DEP uh, enforces that requires you as an employer to reduce the number of single-occupant vehicle trips to your site. And um, also, in the city of Cambridge in particular, there's now a parking and transportation demand management process that the city, that employers within the city have to comply with. Both of those are asking us to reduce the number of employees who uh, come to campus, come to our site um, in significantly. So we have to, there's some compliance there. Um, obviously it's a responsible thing to do to provide sustainable transportation options. And as an employer, you have a captive audience in that you can email everyone within your organization. You can, you know, we have an intranet site at Harvard, as many companies do. You have a way, you have an audience that you can uh, communicate to more easily than you can just in the general population. So Harvard, I've touched on some of these issues already, um, cares about sustainable transportation um, because it's easy. Um, as you see from this map, where the T is located is very central to the entire Cambridge and Alston campus. Um, and a majority of, I mean, it's right next to Harvard Yard, obviously. Um, in addition, almost 50% of Harvard's employees live within three miles of campus, which is a 15-minute bike ride or maybe 40, 45-minute walk, depending on your pace. Um, we have 20,000 employees and 6,000 parking spaces, so uh, it's clear that we need to provide some balance in the options. And let me just say that I am very aware of the fact and am uh, frequently reminded that we do have to provide parking at Harvard, and as any employer does, because there are people who have um, mobility issues, there are people who don't live um, close enough to transit that it's practical for them to use it. And uh, I think of Steve's case, I always tell people who are uh, new employees coming to Harvard, um, whatever you do, don't move to Newton, because uh, the, I always get in a bad mood if I have to ride the green line. Um, sorry, Eric. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's inconvenient um, from certain areas, and in some cases, transit just isn't available at all. Um, also, Harvard University is hi highly visible, and as such, we have a responsibility to sort of lead by example. Um, there's no free parking. Um, if you, as an employer, provide free parking, you are going to be paying for it in some other way because those, the cost of that land use for parking is somehow going to take away from your, clearly from your revenue um, or from other benefits you could be providing your employees. Employees who do pay for parking think more about using alternatives um, that are less expensive. And um, employees who pay for parking, um, they can also take advantage of pre-tax benefits. So um, it's, if you can charge for parking and it doesn't have to burden the employee as much um, if, if you don't provide pre-tax benefits. Uh, something happened to this graphic, I apologize. I hope you still get the gist of it, um, how parking is paid for at Harvard. Um, the cost this year for an annual parking permit um, just for a, a, a pooled surface lot is $915 uh, for a garage space. Um, it's 980 I believe. That is only 36% of the cost of what it costs Harvard to provide that parking space. Um, again, largely because of all the underground parking we're building on campus. And um, 
so Harvard is subsidizing parking. Um, and, you know, so the question is, um, so, so we are trying to provide the balance where we're subsidizing parking. We're also subsidizing other modes of transportation, as I'll show you in a second. So what, what do people who don't bring their car to Harvard get as a benefit? Um, we, the Commuter Choice Program um, at Harvard, provide assistance uh, for people who want to plan their transit route or their bike route or their walking route to work. Um, we, Harvard subsidizes monthly subway bus and combo passes by 40 percent and commuter rail passes by 50 percent. In addition, we provide that, uh, that expense, um, we allow that expense to be paid out of employees' paycheck on a pre-tax basis. So, um, you know, roughly 30 percent extra um, is saved by the employee by virtue of the pre-tax benefit. And I wanted to just mention that any employer who's willing to take on a, a little extra administrative burden um, to set this process up can take advantage of that uh, benefit because it is an IRS benefit and can, you know, as I mentioned, save an, an employee up to somewhere around 30 percent off the cost of the transit, up to $105 a month. So we also provide biking and walking programs and incentives at Harvard. Um, for $25 a year, you can join Zipcar um, and uh, take advantage of that. We have free shuttles, both the Harvard shuttle that goes around campus and the M2 shuttle that goes between Harvard's Cambridge campus and the Longwood Medical Area. Both of those are free for Harvard employees, and they both have bike racks on the front of them to increase multimodal trips. Um, the shuttles are running on biodiesel, I should mention. Um, we're using an 80-20 mix right now um, and are hoping to increase the percentage of uh, soy um, biodiesel that we have in the mix. We provide assistance forming car and van pools, and uh, if you do van pool to Harvard, you park there for free. Um, and we provide a 50% uh, discount on your annual parking permit if you come in to work every day with just one other person. We also provide one-day parking permits online um, for people who need to come to Harvard who normally would use transit or bike or walk um, but need to have bring their car in for one day because they're carrying something heavy or because uh, they need to do an errand during the day. All or many of these options here are provided to support people who don't bring a car to campus. They can use, uh, we have nine zip car spaces at Harvard that uh, are on campus spread throughout, um, in addition to several other zip car spaces that are close by that um, people can take advantage of during the day to get around. I put this graphic in here just to provide a little inspiration when we realized we needed to provide some um, significant amount of bike parking at Harvard, I, I looked on the web and tried to find examples of sort of creative and visually attractive bicycle parking structures and found almost nothing in this country. Um, I did only do a web search, um, but I, I worked with an architect to develop this, which comes with several interesting um, extra extras for bicyclists, including benches that they can change from their bike shoes to their street shoes on, and a wall-mounted uh, bike maintenance stand. And the, the plan shows solar panels that will provide lighting. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Holly. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Rosenblum. He's the executive director and co-founder of uh, the Livable Streets Alliance. Um, he uh, has uh, 15 years of experience in public policy, training, education, and community advocacy. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chella. Um, 
I have about 10 minutes, and I'm going to take you visually through some thinking about urban areas. Our organization and I have been focusing work on, on urban Boston, not necessarily by boundary of city, so not the city of Boston, but where there's a density of people, a density of downtown districts, and a density of uh, transit. So what is transportation? So we look at this map, and what do people, what do people think? Well, it's, it's the train map. It tells us where the trains go. We're trying to change that thinking and instead saying, this is just all about trains, instead trying to think of what, uh, what kind of investments we're making in our transportation systems. And here's a cartoon. Uh, oftentimes we talk about the highway system, and that's been a public investment. But whenever we talk about transit, that's been a wasteful subsidy. So we're trying to change the thinking about that. And the uh, Governor Romney, when he stood up and introduced the 20-year transportation plan, said that he wants to be changing, wants the state to be changing from thinking about moving cars and then think about transit separately. Instead, think about moving people in whatever form that's going to take. Uh, economic development is a core piece of, of transit, and we want to be thinking about transit as an economic growth engine, and therefore we need to invest in it just like we'd invest in other types of things. We need to be thinking about the future. If we think about the future of Boston, the, in 30 years from now, we're going to have more elderly people, more foreign-born people, more black, Hispanic, and Asian people, and fewer white people. So what that means is that it takes a while to develop transportation systems. We need to be thinking now about what the population is that's going to be using transit in the future and be planning for that now. I'd like to talk a little bit about our streets. This is a scene that people might have thought about from the past, and we're hoping to recreate some elements of this where streets were not just for cars but for urban life. This is a satellite view of Commonwealth Avenue right by the Boston University Bridge where we're doing some advocacy work. And there's a heck of a lot of cars there, but if you think about what actually happens here, there's a significant amount of foot traffic and transit traffic, yet the focus has really been on, on the vehicle in this area. So this is a, a shot from that exact intersection, and the question is, are we really serving all of our users as best as we can with the way that we design and the way we maintain our streets? This also is that intersection. Uh, vehicle design speed is a key part of, of urban um, transportation issues. How, how much space do cars take up? This is a nice little video. So we start with a street full of cars. What if we just yanked everyone out of their cars and had them just sitting in their seats on the road? Well, there's a lot more space. Then what if we stuck them all on bicycles? And then what if we moved them all over into the bike lane? Look at all that extra space that could be used for outdoor cafes, for green space, um, for a lot of other things besides a, a large quantity of metal. A lot of what our organization is doing in terms of urban environment is thinking about streets as more than just for cars and transforming them to a different type of environment. So we're going to go through a little transformation right in front of our very eyes, thanks to technology. And we're going to take this street, which has a significant amount of focus on cars and not as much on the urban environment, and we're going to focus on some putting in some buildings, some storefronts that are actually enjoyable to walk on. Um, then we're going to fix the quality of the pavement and the sidewalk, put in a couple trees. Uh, and then, of course, the people will come. When you build these types of urban environments, people will come and populate it. This is another example of uh, a street transformation. This is sort of a typical, not necessarily downtown urban, but uh, you know, right outside of a downtown district. What if we transformed that exact space and put transit there, took away some of the car lanes for that, added bike lanes, and increased uh, the quality of the landscaping? That has a, a big impact on the, the downtown district, and these are the types of um, visions that we're trying to put forth. This is an example of Portland, Oregon. They shifted a particularly busy downtown street to be bus and bike only. And you can see the difference from the left to the right, where the, the emphasis really is on moving the people around. And the amount of people that move down this corridor is uh, more than tripled since this change has been made. 
This is an example in Copenhagen of a street that is called a Wunorf that is a, a mixed use. There aren't really sidewalks. It might look as if there's sidewalks, but the, the space is perfectly level all the way across. There are two of these that are going to be installed in Cambridge in Harvard Square, so be looking for those. I won't tell you where they are, so you can see if you can find them in uh, a year or so when they get you know, put in. Um, this looks like a pedestrian-only zone, but in fact it's not. This is a car uh, that's going right through that street and allows for the deliveries but the people driving need to acknowledge that they're sharing it with a lot of other people and then they behave in a different fashion. So let's just take a look at that again. Pedestrian only? No. Cars going right through it. People sitting outside eating, walking, cycling, not a problem at all. So what we're working on is balance. This is an image from Portland, Oregon, where citizens were in a neighborhood area, were upset about the speed of traffic, and they thought, well, what if we just painted a big square or image in the middle of the road and then had some library shelves on the side and some, uh, someone had a lemonade stand and there was some artwork put up. And they all got out and said, we're going to do this. Of course, the city wasn't all that excited about it. But once they did it and, and showed the success of bringing a community together to take back a part of street, they now passed an ordinance making this legal as long as enough of the abutters are in favor of it. What else can be done to rethink uh, rethink this balance between cars and other forms. In London, they recently uh, installed this thing called congestion charging that many of you have heard about that makes a charge of about $8 if you go into the downtown district. Um, this is an image of people going in. And what did that do? It, it made the amount of bicycling in the downtown core area three times what it was to start. And in parallel to putting in this congestion charging, they also increased the amount of bus service, which was um, pretty tremendous. This is an image of a car-free day in Bogota. And I'd like to put on a three-minute video. I know Cello just gave me the two-minute warning, but I think he will excuse me. Let's see if I can use this. And we'll hope the sound works. This is from Boston. at the moment, right, honey? Two cars, but I'm trying to talk her into one. <laughs> makes things a lot more, you know, easy going. You're so dreamy, you're so sweet. Swept completely. 
And to conclude, a cartoon trying to put this in perspective, who is really the successful man in this picture? And how does society perceive these types of transportation modes? Um, and a, a last a statistic, people that live on streets with slower traffic have more friends. That was an actual academic study. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. That was very entertaining and very informative at the same time. Uh, we have two more panelists, and then you have a little bit of time for uh, questions. I think the next panel is uh, a few speakers short, so we might be able to go a few minutes over, I think. Um, so Eric Scher is the next uh, panelist. He's the uh, project director for op operations at the MBTA. Um, a big part of his work uh, has been to make transit facilities fully accessible for uh, seniors and persons with disabilities. And he also serves on Walk Boston's uh, board of directors, and um, he's a senior tour guide with Boston uh, by foot. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, I guess I'll be the one speaker who doesn't have a PowerPoint. I could have brought films of trains, the Green Line trolleys, and, uh, but I chose not to. Um, you know, I think everybody is familiar with the T. Uh, I, I assume everybody rode the T to get here today. You know, I, I guess there was a problem. There was a, some security drill over at the Galleria, so I guess the Green Line wasn't running out to Museum of Science. So. Um, I guess the, the state spent about a million dollars just doing that, this sort of training just to make sure that we could respond to an emergency. And so over at the T, it was, you know, it was just very disruptive to have to interrupt service. But we had a good bus shuttle system going. I think, I think everybody knows that one of the T's primary goals is to get people to switch to cars. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> But the uh, no, seriously. Sometimes, sometimes people really uh, feel like that we intentionally, you know, really run a, a horrible level of service so that people to discourage people, you know. So, but in reality, I mean, I spend most of my time at the T just trying to improve things, trying to make it so the service is faster, is more reliable, uh, the trains are cleaner, the stations are cleaner, and you know, as you can imagine, it's. It, it's very hard to please people. It's very hard to, uh, to get people to, to recognize the fact that there's huge economic benefits, personal and society-wise, to, uh, to switch, to leave the cars at home. So, you know, we, we just plug away. But I guess just to, just to give you a really brief overview of the T, we're like the fifth largest transit property in the country. We carry about 1.1 1, 1, 1 .1 million passengers a day which is a, you know, a fairly significant number. Uh, there are about four and a half or five million people that live in the, like the 175 community service area. So we carry, you know, it's, it's a significant number, but it's nowhere near as high as we'd like it to be, especially when you look at the traffic congestion. 
Uh, we have about 2,500 revenue vehicles. That's buses, trains, trolleys, uh, ride vans. So we have, a, we have some good passenger carrying capacity, and it's, we're not really at the limits. We can <clears throat> certainly carry more people with the, excuse me. <clears throat> but I think, you know, I think part of it is, is, you know, if we have the support from the communities, then we're able to expand our capacity and provide a greater level of service, which will attract more riders. Uh, we have uh, almost 300 stations in the Boston area, and you know I can run through all sorts of numbers, like 20 miles of tunnels and 800 bridges. But I think you know some of the interesting you know factoids which I've collected over the years is that we're like only one of four cities in the country where transit trips actually beat auto trips. That's into the, into the downtown Boston area or into a, a, a downtown CBD. And so you, you start to realize that Boston does have very good transit coverage. It's, it's a compact city, and the, the density of transit is phenomenal for a, for a city of this size. Uh, the financial district alone, 60 percent of all the people who work in the financial district take transit to work, which is, you know, it's a fairly high percentage. And so it's you know, I think New York City has comparable uh, percentage of transit trips. And I think that, you know, one of the advantages the T has is that, uh, you know, in because the Boston is such a dense area, like 80 percent of the jobs in Boston are located within a quarter mile of a transit station. So, which is, you know, if we could get all the people to take transit and then walk up to a quarter mile uh, to their jobs, it would, it would make a huge difference. I think the central artery that we're looking at now, or the, the big dig, would really take on a totally different face if, if we had, you know, even 25 percent of those people switching to transit. Uh, also, 56 percent of the homes in Boston are located within a quarter mile of transit. So, uh, really on both ends of trips, there's a huge potential, untapped potential there. Uh, I think uh, let me. I just want to talk about uh, like three different aspects uh, that I'm involved with at the T. And one is our bus service. And I noticed Holly, when you were talking about your, the Harvard Square and the T station there, there was no mention of the buses that that serve Harvard University, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, the buses carry 40 percent of our passengers, and most people don't realize that. You know, to many people, the buses are pretty much invisible. We see buses as being these 40-foot yellow monsters that have ads on the side of them and spew smoke. But uh, the reality is, is that they play an important part of the, the system. Uh, we've, re over the past couple of years, we've made huge, huge investments in our bus fleet. Our bus fleet now is an average of about four to five years old, each bus. Uh, three years ago, the average age was about 14 years old. So we've made huge strides there in terms of uh, improving the quality of the buses. We have one of the newest fleets in the country now, which is something we're very proud of. And uh, the new buses have a mostly low floor to facilitate uh, persons with disabilities. And we also have automatic stop announcements to really, uh, you know, to, prov to provide full accessibility, but also just to help our customers. Uh, we're also putting in new shelters around the city and the outlying areas. And we're, all, we're targeting uh, about 15 bus routes, you know, heavy, heavily used bus routes, and we're focusing on these routes and trying to add some service, trying to uh, provide better customer service uh, with announcements and with uh, better supervision on, the, supervision on the line so that buses, instead of, if a bus is supposed to run every 15 minutes, it does. So I know that's one of the complaints we have, that people can't rely on buses because the schedule says they arrive every 15 minutes and they don't. And so it's, I think one of the exciting areas that uh, we're, in the, we're working on is various ITS applications, and one of them is called CAD AVL, which is uh, it's a, it's a automatic, automatic dispatch system which, which allows us to see where each bus is at any one time. So every one of our new buses that we're buying, we're, in the, we're constantly in the process of bringing new buses on the property, they will be equipped with a GPS transponder and we, in the control center, we will actually be able to see where every bus is. And so if you look at a particularly busy route like the number one, right now that's, you know, that's one of our heaviest ridership lines. And if we can keep a regular headway, if we can see from a centralized control station where each bus is, uh, we, can, it, we can add more buses to the service or we can, we can have certain buses slow down or 
stop temporarily so that we can uh, catch up with a delay or catch up with a, with a headway which has fallen behind. So it's an application of ITS that we're very excited about. Uh, it's right now that's it's already in place on the Silver Line uh, on Washington Street. And we've been having troubles with it. It's, it is a new technology, and we haven't gotten it quite right yet, but we're getting close. And, uh, at each, and it's something that you see in other countries and other properties where if you're waiting for a bus, there's an electronic sign which tells you what, when the next bus is arriving. And it's something we're going to see more and more of. Uh, I think the other, the other thing about a bus service is that we really been fo it ties into the whole discussion about clean fuels and clean energy and how we uh, we're like we probably have the largest alternative fuel fleet in the New England area. About a third of our buses now run on compressed natural gas, and the rest of our fleet is uh, running on diesel engines. But I think what's happened in the past few years is that uh, diesel has become much cleaner. It's a combination of using ultra-low sulfur diesel fuels and also of various engine technologies and filters. So uh, we're sort of excited about that. Uh, just quickly, the uh, we also have a very active bicycle uh, plan, and we're putting bike racks on most of our bus fleets. Uh, by next summer, about half of our buses should have bike racks on them. And you know, I, I, I guess I don't have time to run through all the various station projects we're working on, but I think people have seen all the activity there. And, and as Sonia was saying, we also do quite a bit with transit-oriented development. It's a great way for us to take advantage of surplus MBTA property. Uh, it's a great way for the T to generate revenue. And it's, it's something that this, this project's all around the Boston area where there's, there's just this wonderful potential to, to tie employers into transit, into uh, essentially destinations and origins and trying to bring them close together. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Our final speaker uh, today is Jackie Wilkins. And Jackie Wilkins is a senior project manager at Massport. And um, she's uh, been an environmental professional in Massachusetts for 28 years. And uh, she's um, done graduate work in environmental studies. Thank you. Um, I have a few brief remarks and uh, no presentation, but firstly I wanted to thank, uh, as others have, those of you who've come out this morning, and I also would like to thank Allison and other folks that are involved in Alt Wheels for providing this opportunity. Um, it's actually because of my involvement in Alt Wheels that I haven't had time to put together anything uh, on PowerPoint, but I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Um, I took a slightly different, um, I think because of what I do, um, a, a slightly different tact on the, on the question of what it is that, what are our choices around uh, sustainability. Certainly if you've been here yesterday and today, you've seen that there are lots of choices fuel types, technologies, um, uh, et cetera. But I wanted to personalize the question for those of you who might not yet be involved either in alt wheels or in sustainable transportation through the work that you, you, you may be doing, um, and suggest that at uh, some level it's a matter of personal choices uh, to get involved and to, um, to do what you know, at whatever level, it, it, wherever you're at, there's room at the table for everybody to contribute. That's really the essence of my message today. And I wanted to give just a little bit of a testimony, if you guys would uh, bear with that. Um, uh, but before that, again, uh, I, I just wanted to make the point that, um, you know, because of where we are and because of all of the, the areas where there are, um, there's work to be done, there's room at the table for everybody. That's, I think, the message of Alt Wheels. It's the message that I've heard in many of the presentations, both yesterday and today. Um, I personally am somebody, I feel like a reformed SUV driver. Um, I uh, gave it up a couple of years ago um, and would love to be able to uh, put in an auction on one of the couple of Priuses that are available this weekend but uh, need to get through my son's tuition 
cost and won't be able to do that. So, um, you know, at, at the very least, I've stepped down in terms of my personal use. And I'm uh, finding that walking is enjoyable to me uh, in part because of the exercise that I obviously need, but also because I'm looking at it from this more holistic uh, sort of lifestyle thing. So uh, I was impressed with myself this morning until I met many of the other panelists who have come today by bicycle or at least a, a hybrid. So there's room for improvement and invo involvement and improvement based on wherever you're at. There are two things that I wanted to share with you this morning. There are two groups that I personally am involved in um, that I'm happy to say have been supportive uh, um, with Alt Wheels. First, I work for Massport and a uh, quick commercial for the Massport, um, if you don't mind. Uh, Massport is a quasi-public entity that is responsible for three airports, Logan Airport, Hanscom Field, and um, Worcester Airport. And we also have a maritime division and are responsible for the Tobin Bridge. Uh, I do environmental planning and permitting there and um, in part try to comply with some of the ideas that Sonia put forward. Um, and I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, Massport has, uh, I think, uh, stepped up to the plate historically. You'll see it, uh, Massport uh, um, represented this weekend both by our 10-year-old, more than 10-year-old, uh, CNG bus fleet um, and, um, you know, come by our exhibit uh, next weekend. You'll see, find out some more about what Massport does. Uh, Massport has been supporting Alt Wheels uh, for the last four years. Um, this year has been uh, willing to step up and be not just a, a supporter by donating the uses of our, our buses to transport people to and from the facility, but also um, to um, uh, contribute financially. I'm really personally proud to work for um, an authority that understands that our civic purpose and helping out in areas like this is important. Um, and the, the, what I found is that working on all wheels is providing a certain level of cachet for me in getting my normal work done. So the, um, there's an opportunity for synergy that I have, I have encountered where if you get involved with something that you feel passionate about, is necessary, is uh, good work, that there are multiple ways where that can benefit you. So Alt Wheels has, um, being in, involved with Alt Wheels, and in, in, um, particularly this year where the need has been greater, I think will um, allow me to, um, you know, advance our cause internally. I've seen positive reaction to the support um, or our involvement in, um, in Alt Wheels. So I just wanted to share that. And then the second piece that I wanted to, um, well, before I, I move on to the second piece, I, I also wanted to just say that there are several things that Massport does. We have an all-fuel fleet that includes 33 buses that a shuttle bus is on airport that have been running off of CNG for the last, uh, since 1995. You'll see uh, that exhibited in the buses this weekend. Uh, we've got a fun um, picture on them to, to, to recognize that. We have other alternative fuel vehicles in our fleet, um, and we do a lot to promote uh, transit uh, options for people getting to and from Logan Airport. Uh, we provide discounts to um, users of the airport that, um, such as taxis, hotel shuttles, limousines, um, if they are run on alternative fuel, they get a 50% discount in the uh, ground access fee that they have to pay to Massport for doing business at the airport. Um, in case you didn't know, Massport is uh, like the MBTA. Well, I, I don't know. I shouldn't talk for the MBTA, but I, I think this is true. Massport is a separate authority, quasi-public authority. Our money does not come from uh, the general fund, as uh, is the case with many other agencies. Uh, we 
kind of have to operate like a business because we run on the revenues that our um, um, facilities generate. And so um, uh, this incentive, you know, is I think a big one that we offer to try to uh, encourage others uh, to um, who do business at airport to uh, at the airport uh, to um, run on alternative fuel. Uh, one other thing that we're working on that is a future initiative, really, that has come out of the my involvement with many of the people who are uh, sort of overlap with all wheels. It's a subset of the Clean Cities Group. Is that we're working with the City of Boston, um, who which recently has. To, been able to get the first green cab in the city. It's a hybrid Camry. It'll be on display this weekend. And Massport will be developing a policy to allow um, front of line privileges in our taxi pool uh, for alternative fuel vehicles, as is the case in some other airports. So stay tuned. You'll get more details on that later. Um, I wanted to also just mention, if you don't mind, a, uh, another organization that I've been involved in um, that is also supporting uh, WTA, I mean, excuse me, Alt Wheels uh, this year, for the, but this is for the first time. The organization is called WTS. It's the Women's Transportation Seminar. It's a professional organization that's about advancing women in transportation. And um, the Boston chapter, which is comprised of about 400 members, women and men, is one of the largest of 39 chapters uh, internationally. We now have uh, one chapter in London and one in Western Canada. And it was formed in 1977 by a bunch of women who really needed, felt the need to have an outlet for networking and sharing, professional development, mentoring, um, in what was and remains a male-dominated uh, industry. Um, and as I uh, get more involved with sustainable mobility issues, it seems to me that the concept of advancing women in transportation is not just about um, pay equity and access to senior positions and all of those very uh, noteworthy things that we um, we and WTS have been focused on for many, uh, for the many years that we've existed. But it's also about, um, you know, the, the ends, how can I say this uh, succinctly? It seems to me that having women as part of the equation will also um, help with a lot of these kinds of issues, help advance a lot of these kinds of issues, much, much like was the case with the environmental movement um, when I first started my career. So um, with that, because I see that I'm just about running out of time, um, I just wanted to say that my personal vision is that um, WTS can help all wheels to uh, propagate itself regionally um, and, um, you know, through, through our chapters that are all over the country, if there's a way that we can continue to work together and expand that. And uh, I personally am working on that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. I, I feel we, we officially run out of time, but I, th I think we'll have about uh, 10 minutes for questions. It might be easiest to gather a bunch of questions and then have the panelists responds, respond. Hi, Vicky. I have a question for you. In our back door in Watertown, we have the best battery system for hybrid vehicles. I've got to come on board in about two or three years. I'm worried about carbon dioxide. New York is now spending, what, 12 to $15 million to convert a lot of their cars to hybrid vehicles in, with using batteries, the eliminate of carbon dioxide in New York. Why can't we be in Massachusetts? We have the batteries, we have the cars, we have the technology. Why can't we be the first ones to really have a CO2-free city? Uh, 
Uh, following the end of the uh, Big Dig project and that decade-long saga, $14 billion later, now it's over. Uh, do you see that as the beginning of a more transit-oriented, um, more transit-favorable uh, budget and outlook from the uh, state perspective, uh, perhaps filling in the circumference? Uh, because right now we have a spider system. Let's see, is a spider system. Uh, any additional funding that you see for filling in the circumference of Boston and, and reducing the need for cars? Um, while I was listening to all the uh, presentations, unfortunately I kept thinking of um, whenever I saw some good idea about you know, transit-oriented development or, you know, alternative to uh, auto, only automobile transportation. I would start thinking of local examples of uh, situations where people are trying to do that, and then I would often be reminded to myself that there's often local opposition. So it seems like we have this situation that the general public and especially policymakers in the big picture agree, yeah, all these things are good. But when it comes to try to implement them, there's also, there's very often um, local opposition, you know, for good reasons in most cases. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any way to um, get people to continue to look at the big picture when it comes down to these local situations. And, you know, like uh, opposition to the Greenbush line construction, even though that has now happened, and now opposition to the extending the commuter rails to New Bedford and Fall River. And, most, uh, a lot of bike-related uh, proposals for rail trail conversions are met with opposition, et cetera. So I'm wondering, maybe we need, maybe this could be in the Office of Commonwealth Development, I don't know where, but I wonder if there could be some high-level uh, office where <clears throat> uh, people could go to for assistance and sort of brokering and negotiating some of these, um, around some of these impediments. Or, you know, where you could bring an issue up and say, look, it, here's this good thing we're trying to do, but here's either this bureaucratic uh, opposition to it or local opposition and, and get some help on, you know, brokering the, these problems. So just an idea. Thanks. We'll take two more questions and then we'll... Hi, uh, Jeff. I wonder if I could ask you to comment on the one slide that you had up which showed the... Uh, profile or combination of the future uses of transportation and the impact that it would have uh, on the needs of uh, transportation needs. Um, hi, uh, mine is a, a two-part question. One is um, uh, why uh, walking is not uh, more focused on and promoted um, I was involved in uh, creating the bike paths in Cambridge many years ago. And we did uh, we checked in some research, and most people in Cambridge travel three miles, and uh, and much of the traffic uh, goes around and around looking for a parking space. And so that uh, when bike paths were put in, uh, even though they lost uh, lanes, they actually uh, uh, lessened the traffic uh, a year later after those went in, and. Um, and the other thing about walking, uh, all the health professionals uh, seem to agree that uh, a daily 20-minute aerobic exercise is probably the, the most important thing for health, and it's probably even more important than diet and almost anything else we could possibly do for uh, diabetes, cholesterol, heart, brain, life, uh, longevity, preventing disease, etc. So, and then the last part of that is public education. Um, this uh, is very important to pack this room next year and also to get these concepts, these brilliant concepts going on here, but the average person doesn't know about them, and that budgets need to have a certain percentage of public education to get the wisdom and brilliance of what's been discussed in these two days out to the general public so that in any planning, any dollars, any budget besides the research, you need to leave aside some uh, public outreach, public education, so that you're sharing you know, the concepts don't s stay in an office on a shelf in a, in a study in a PowerPoint presentation, but actually get out to the people. Thank you. Should we start from this end then? Would you like to s start, Steve, or response? Well, I can, I can really comment on the, um, the city's 
your comment in the back about getting you run into brick walls when you try to you know make your your community more bikeable walkable or there's a planning development going on and you get get to the city council and they go oh, you want to add a sidewalk forget it it's going to cost too much money um, I think the important thing is to take a hard look at your city council your planning boards and if they aren't environmental environmentally walkable bikeable friendly then get them off the boards and elect people who are you know I think I happen to be in a community with a city council unbeknownst to me when I'm struggling with biodiesel was supporting clean air and the environment and because of that they're putting money back in my budget to do things like burn biodiesel so I'm lucky and I'm in a minority but I think you've got to you've got to really take a hard look at you know your leaders in if you want a more healthier community um, the state of New Hampshire had one day in May we had a bike walk to work day and it was all done with volunteers we had in a small community of Keene we had over a hundred people come out and ride or walk their bike to work and it encouraged that and those are the kind of events that that might work in communities to get more aware of the the walking and the, the exercise Those are great questions, actually, um, all of them. Um, and I guess there are a couple of themes. Uh, I guess on the hybrids, why we can't be the hybrid conversion capital of the world, I, um, I don't know. I think it would, it's a great vision to have. Um, generally, I think the integrated vehicles that are already, you know, where the, where the vehicles designed to be integrated, I think, are more functional right now. But whether we could actually figure out a way to, to retrofit um, certainly is possible. It sounds like a good vision to have. Um, in terms of new big dig and, and whether or not that frees up funding for transit, absolutely um, it does. And um, Mark Drayson's here from Metropolitan Area Planning Council. I think he may talk in his talk a little bit about um, the kind of planning that's going forward and the transit um, projects that are being put forward, including the Urban Ring and a number of other sort of infill and, and redesign uh, of the transit system are, are really laudable things that some of them are happening and some of them ought to be happening. Uh, and actually, some of them came out of the negotiations, the environmental negotiations over the Big Dig. Uh, some of the most interesting projects and the, and the emphasis on transit that's actually happened in the last few years was linked absolutely legally in, uh, in every way to the Big Dig, but more needs to happen. Um, the idea of you know, ways to reduce local opposition to projects, the idea of some kind of a negotiating group. It's really interesting that you brought that up because I actually have a proposal on my desk right now that's exactly that. It creates an, a, a project office within our office that um, essentially would do that kind of brokering and negotiation over some of the nittier, grittier problems that are out there and, um, and we'll bring it forward and see whether that, I think that is the kind of um, implementation uh, level work that actually needs to happen now. I think we do have a lot of the good policies in place, but when it comes to individual projects, there are really difficult day-to-day -day -day issues around how to put some of these projects forward, and um, it really takes a different scale than we've been able to apply to it. Um, and, you know, other questions, I, I, I won't answer the question about what future users, uh, what, what the shift in demographics means for future use, but I'm hope, hope, hopeful somebody else can answer that. And uh, why isn't walking the focus? I think it really is. A lot of the sustainable development um, principles do include a new, really new focus on walking and bicycling. And the highway design manual, the same. Um, just to be able to require that walking be included in new projects that, um, uh, that we're not walling off parts of our city. But it also is, you know, at a behavioral level, the, the kinds of changes that you're talking about are hard for government to force people to do. So I think we've been looking, um, both public health agencies and in state government, at ways to put the message out. But I don't think we've really gotten it right yet on how to, you know, how to be persuasive but not seem like we're forcing, like like the government's telling you it's time to walk, because that generally isn't people don't react to it too well. So I, we have to go further on the advocacy part. I'd like to also speak to the promotion of walking as an excellent solution um, and probably the most sustainable way of getting around in terms of your health, your the sustainability of your health as well as your community. Um, at Harvard, I, I just didn't mention it because I, uh, I kind of had such a short time frame to speak, but we've been holding events where we encourage people to walk to work. Um, there's a big breakfast at the end and it's very social. 
Um, we've also had a one-stop walk on two separate occasions where we ask employees to get off the tee one stop early. Uh, we did one in Porter Square and we did one in Central Square. Um, there was also free coffee involved there and raffle prizes and all kinds of groovy things, also very social. Um, it, but I've wrestled a lot uh, in my role with the question of how to provide financial incentives because um, cash is always the best incentive. And we essentially do that, as you saw from my graphic, um, to subsidize parking and that we also subsidize transit passes. How could we you know, provide some financial incentive for walkers and cyclists? I think to date one of the biggest challenges has been that it's difficult to prove that you walk or bike. I mean, people have an, an actual transit pass and have a, you know, a receipt from having purchased it in some cases. Um, it, it's, so there's an honor system issue there for, for one thing. Also, um, for people who uh, use transit, um, the federal government is willing to provide a subsidy uh, because there is that proof. Um, but the, but in any case, when you provide a, a tax benefit, um, or when you, uh, let's see, how should I say this? That when you give people cash, extra cash at work, it's taxable income. Um, so there is a mechanism in place for for uh, avoiding that for people who use transit or van pool currently, but there isn't yet for biking and walking. I know that there is some pending legislation right now on that that would address people who bike to work and who uh, carpool, providing pre-tax benefits. So there's, there's some hope. Just a quick comment on the communicating the message, which I think was part of your, uh, your comment about uh, the walking and health. I think... Um, for me, uh, those areas where I have influence and I try, you know, I think it's up to each one of us to adopt the same sort of uh, thinking. Um, and WTS has monthly luncheon programs that are attended by 150 to 200 people. And certainly we've been trying to get more and more um, sustainable mobility topics to be part of the mix. So um, that's just one venue or one avenue for responding to that. Uh, also, very good questions. Uh, I think a bunch of us will be available afterwards to, if people want to ask some more detailed questions. Uh, in terms of the question directed at me specifically, the, de the demographics of the future are the demographics of people that ride transit, that uh, we want, for example, elderly who we want to be able to stay in their home as long as possible rather than being moved somewhere else. And the best way to do that is to be able to provide walkable streets and transit for them to be able to maintain that lifestyle. So that's an important element of that. There's a woman by the name of Stephanie Pollock at Northeastern who wrote a report called On the Right Track that uh, has a lot of good information about the relationship between transit and economic growth. So I encourage you to look at that. And there's some information and some presentations you can view online of hers on our website. Uh, quick plug for our newsletter. We put out a newsletter once a month, and I encourage everybody to subscribe. We have about 15, 1,600 people. And it's a good way of getting an understanding from, uh, from a public perspective of what are all the issues that are going on in all these different fields of transportation. And being, I, I sort of took a quick look around. I guess I'm the only advocate on the panel, so for, for you know, for the sense of good, uh, you know, panel balance um, and sort of healthy dialogue. I think there are a lot of issues between advocates and government around how some of these things work. I think that around the transit commitments, there currently is a lawsuit in place from Conservation Law Foundation against the state because of advocacy feeling that the state hasn't been living up to all of its, its uh, commitments <clears throat> with regard to transit. So I think that's an important balance that uh, people are trying to, to do. A lot of those transit projects that are discussed are behind schedule, don't have even the basic conceptual plans done. So to think that things like the Green Line are going to get done uh, any time soon uh, is a little bit misleading. What we really need is a solid commitment from the state to say, we're going to do it, we're going to do the designs for it, and we're going to help make it happen. And there's been a lot of talk of that. We want to see some action. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and in terms of the Mass Highway Design Guidelines that were mentioned, those are excellent guidelines from the Highway Department on how we design all of our roads for the future. Uh, and in terms of communication to the public and encouragement, I think if we look at the way our streets are designed, cars, so the top three priorities when designing streets are usually automobiles, cars, and automobiles. And <laughs> until, <laughs> until we change that and we change the priorities of our streets, that's the best way of communicating to the public what, what we, we want them to do. If we want them to drive a car, let's put in lots of focus on the streets. If we want people to walk, let's put better timing for lights, better signals, better crosswalks. If we want people to cycle, let's make connections between a lot of the bike paths that we already have. Let's make connections between Somerville and Boston, where a lot of people want a bike. I think that's the best way of, of um, communicating. I'll leave all the transit discussions for. <laughs> uh, just, just briefly on the question about, uh, you know, will there be more favorable funding for transit? And I, it's hard to say. I think there's the T is constantly struggling with uh, trying to provide expansions in service, whether it's going up to Lynn or uh, going out to the Cape or going, you know, extending the Green Line out to uh, Medford Hillside. And I think these are big challenges in terms of finding the funding for these things. I think in many cases, like Sonia said, there's, we're committed to do some of these projects. Uh, nobody really knows where the money's coming from, but we're committed to doing them. But I think the, the, the more, the part of this that I focus on is that we, the T and the state are spending huge amounts of money just maintaining what we have already. And that, th those aren't the sexy projects. There's no big scissors or anything. These are things like making sure the air conditioning systems work on the trains, putting in better signal systems. So, for example, you can add additional trains to the red line or the blue line or the orange line. Um, ITS applications. None of these are none of these are sexy projects, but they're projects that really need to be funded. And right now, the T is spending much of their money on just keeping the existing system ma well maintained and operational. And so, I think it's you know, although we'd love to keep on expanding like we have in the past. Uh, we have to play catch up a little bit and, and take what we have and make sure it's, it's, it's running properly and efficiently. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of you. I mean, I'm sorry we ran over time, but this is a big topic that, you know, everyone on this panel has been spending most of their careers researching and working on. So, like Jeff said, if you have questions, please stop by and talk to one of us. But let's give everyone a hand first. Thanks.